Tony Mott, thanks for your time. Not a problem at all. Not a problem. What came first for you, the love of rock and roll or photography, and how did you marry the two? That's a good question, and I'm not quite sure I can answer it. Um, I've always loved rock and roll from university days. Uh, I used to go and see bands all the time. So I suppose rock and roll comes slightly first. And then as soon as I left England and travelled, and I travelled extensively in my uh, teen years and my early 20s, went to about 40-odd countries. And so I wanted a document where I was travelling. So uh, an art student friend taught me black and white printing and processing. And uh, that was my love of photography. And then by the time I settled into Sydney in the early 80s, and Sydney had an amazing live music scene, uh, it was a natural combination of two hobbies. And next thing I knew, I was photographing musicians. How did that all begin? Well, again, um, I suppose, like everything in life, it's timing. I got lucky one Monday night, on a wet Monday night in King's Cross, I wandered into the Piccadilly Hotel, and the Divinals, who were unsigned at the time, had a residency uh, every Monday night. And of all the subjects to practice on, Chrissy was the best. And so I started photographing Chrissy Amphlett. And so began the journey. How do you photograph someone like Chrissy Amphlett? OK, there's all that dynamic performance. So is that what you're trying to capture, the, the performance? Or are you trying to get under the mask, under the rock and roll persona to get the character? I, I think when you're off stage, you're trying to get under the mask and trying to get some uh, the persona. But on stage, uh, you're just you're photographing the moment, the performance, trying to capture. And it literally is a moment. And when that moment's gone, it's gone. And for all the great shots I'm very proud of, uh, there's many that I miss uh, from circumstances. Uh, I've got no control over the lights, the audience. And in, in those days, particularly, there was no barrier between the audience and the uh, artist. So I was moshing around with everybody and punks jumping on my head. So, uh, yeah, um, circumstances were difficult. But that was the beauty of it. But when you caught a performer in mid mid stride, um, yeah, it was a hell of a thrill. So from this rainy Monday night in Sydney, capturing the Divinals, how did you then go on to chronicle, in effect, the history of Australian rock in the past almost 30 years? Well, it was a happy accident. Uh, at some point during that period of time of photographing the Divinals, they asked to look at the photos and they bought one and it became a tour poster. And um, the fact they paid me was just an unbelievable thrill. I was so proud of it. And then um, street press, as in the uh, what is now the drum media in Sydney, in press, beat, rip it up, all the street presses, that was the birth of them in that period of time. So I went into their offices and started photographing any band that moved I'd shoot. And I was going out four or five nights. It was my social activity. Uh, it was always a hobby. It was never... Um, it was never a chore at any point that I go, oh, I've got to go and photograph someone. I loved it. Uh, slightly obsessed, possibly. Um, I shot everybody, and I loved it. So I just continued and continued. And then after about four or five years, I just thought, is it possible to pay the rent with this? And so I gave it a couple of years, and, um, and then I got other lucky breaks. Uh, next thing I knew, um, Mick Jagger's manager rang me up. They were looking for a tour photographer. I built up a relationship with Mick Jagger, and I ended up touring with the Stones three times. But all of a sudden, that kudos of touring with the Rolling Stones, all of a sudden, you know, you were a name. I wasn't a better photographer, but I was a known photographer. And more jobs kept coming in. Let's have a look at a Rolling Stones photo. No, nah, Mick and Keith, Mick and Keith. Uh, I, I think the great thing about uh, the Rolling Stones is we are talking the yin and yang uh, of rock and roll. Mick, uh, on a good night, runs 25 kilometres in a concert. Unbelievably fit, very charismatic, works the crowd. Keith very rarely goes more than 10 yards from his amp. No <laughs> movement at all. He's just he's in the music, mix, entertaining the crowd. Uh, and they are the Rolling Stones. Um, they have 60 songs rehearsed in a, on a world tour, and they do 20-odd a night. So theoretically, they could do three concerts and never repeat themselves. That's their beauty. And of those 60 songs... 58 of them are classics, so it's like, they are fantastic. And, yeah, they, they, to me, I mean, this is the epitome of rock and roll photography is to go on the road with the Rolling Stones. But what sort of restrictions are placed on you? The Rolling Stones, the self-proclaimed biggest band in the world, and I should imagine there's a bunch of, you can't do this, you can't do that. No, How sur surprisingly no. not. No, the Rolling really? Stones are incredibly ge generous. They, I, I've done three tours with them, and uh, Tony King, each band member has a manager. So it's, it's a, a political, not a nightmare, but a political um, roller coaster of who you're talking to. But Tony King was uh, Mick Jagger's manager. He hired me. Jane Rose uh, manages uh, Keith Richards. And uh, I arrived uh, at, um, at the gig. I get introduced to the band members. I get taken backstage. I have an access to all areas. And basically, they want a f it, it's a fine line. They want you to be a fly on the wall to photograph everything. But at the same time, 
you're not to irritate the band members. So you, you tread a line. I mean, you, you can't just keep sticking your camera in their faces. But they're very generous. When they were touring Australia, Mick's, a lot of people don't know that Mick's mother is fourth generation Australia, Australian. Mm. And she left um, Sydney in 1939, met Mick's dad in London in 41, and Mick was born. And she lived on the Parramatta Road at Petersham. So we went out together to look at the facade of the house of where his mother lived. Um, and he's a very social being. Um, if he's in a room, he wants to charm everybody. Um, Keith, he doesn't really care who he's charming and who he's not charming. As we were talking earlier, that whole challenge of what you're capturing on stage versus trying to get under the rock and roll mask, what's your favourite in terms of getting a portrait where you thought, I just captured that person, I've captured their soul? Well, that's an example of, of, of capturing... Uh, I'm not sure that I, uh, capturing the soul's um, uh, quite what I've got there, but I've captured the character of Bjork. And, and like all eccentric people, they're never aware of their own eccentricities. When I shot this, um, this has taken... I set up a little studio backstage, very convenient, next to a dressing room. And she said, so what exactly uh, do you want to photograph? And I said, well, I want a straight portrait, but I want to capture your eccentricity. And she goes, well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, you know, on stage and you're doing all those mannerisms in it. And she went, what manner? I don't, I don't do that on stage. And then proceeded to do it. Now, whether she was just playing me, I've no idea. But that photo I'm quite proud of, and I think it's, it, it captures Bjork. If I'd have done that with um, Sheryl Crow or Kate Sobrano, it doesn't work. But with Bjork, that is Bjork. Um, and it's now an iconic photo. It's it, one of those it, photos you look at and go, ah, that's Bjork. Absolutely. And it ended up on, uh, she liked it enough to buy it uh, from me, and it's on the cover of an uh, official uh, biography. Um, and it worked. It, it just, it's the eccentricity of Bjork is there. Um, and funnily enough, I wouldn't be that interested in photographing her again because I don't think I can better it. <laughs> and, and that's why the book was called Rock and Roll Photography is the New Train Spotting, is because I collect. And, and once I've got what I think is a great shot of an artist, um, I'm quite happy to, to move on. Is it because it's also an obsession, as it is for most train spotters? It's exactly that. It's an obsession. Um, I, I'm desperate to get a great shot of Tom Waits because I've never photographed him. Um, it, the forward in the book, I explained that um, Paul Kelly was my quest. I mean, I respect Paul Kelly you know, beyond belief as a musician. And of all the photos I've taken over the years, I've never felt I've actually captured the full Paul Kelly moment. Uh, he's not comfortable in front of a camera, and that's not derogatory towards him. That's, you know, he's a musician. Um, Van Morrison's pretty similar. Um, cranky Irish kid that hates having his photograph uh, taken. Well, Paul, um, I I'm desperate to get the great shot, and I won't be happy until I've got it. How do you go about someone like David Bowie? Contribute musician and performer, and a man of many masks, from Ziggy Stardust to Aladdin saying, maybe these days we're getting something close to. David Bowie, I don't know. You probably know better than me. No, I How do you I, get through a mask or a many masked man and performer like Bowie? I think with someone like Bowie, I think you don't. I think that's the point. I think he's very thespian. He changes his, his you know, he's chameleon in his in both his music and his look and everything. And he's very, very aware of a camera and very aware of a look. Um, so I'm not sure that he allows you to get be, behind the mask. And certainly I haven't got behind the mask of David Bowie on the occasions I've shot him. Um, is but that I, frustrating as a photographer? No, no, I don't find that frustrating at all. I think that's, that's the point of David Bowie is that um, he's very much... The mask is part and parcel of the character of David Bowie. Um, I, I'm not obsessed with trying to get behind a, ma a mask. I'm capturing them as they are, as they present themselves. I've always associated you with being a rock photographer. That's not all you do. It isn't. Let's uh, <laughs> flick ahead to the world, as it were. You mentioned you travelled a lot as a young bloke. Do you still travel with I, the with the lens? I, I'm always I'm always looking to travel. Uh, th these are taken in Mali in Africa. That's the biggest mud building in the world. It's a mud mosque in Jenny in uh, in Mali. I went to Timbuktu. Uh, my two towns, and I have no memory of where I got them from. But when I first started travelling, my two uh, romantic destinations that I had to go to were Kathmandu and Timbuktu, mainly for the names. Uh, it'd be fair to say I had no idea where Timbuktu was uh, until I had a good look on a map. And I ended up going to both over the years. I've been to Kathmandu ten times, and I went to Timbuktu four years ago. Uh, and I just love the... Um, I love the difference of those countries. And as a photographer, how concerned are you that more and more of us are travelling while just staring through a lens. You see folks now who don't take a deep breath and look around. They're now holding their mobile phones up, their, their digital cameras, and it looks like the world is now being viewed through a lens. It'd be fair to say I'd be a bit of a hypocrite if I, thought, if I said anything against that, because I tend to do... I've been doing that for many years. I was once in um, Kathmandu, and an American girl 
just said to me, and I was saying how wonderful Derby Square and all the characters were, and I was taking great photos, I was loving it. She said, oh, have you been down here without your camera? I said, no, no, why would I do that? And she goes, you should try it. I thought, what a strange thing to say. Uh, two days later, it stuck in my mind, and I went down, and I realised exactly what she was saying, that you do view and you frame, and you look at the world very differently. Um, television, cameras do the same, you know. You can't help a camera would look at it and go, oh, that'd look good, or that'd look good with an 85mm lens. That, you're doing that automatically. I'm constantly looking when I wander the streets of Sydney and go, oh, isn't that light beautiful there? Must do a photo session there. <laughs> so you can't help that as a photographer. But, yes, it is a shame when you keep click, click, click all the time and you are doing... Uh, but that's the modern world. What are you going to do? It's, it's, it's what's happened. But as um, uh, the American writer uh, Paul Theroux says, a picture's worth only a thousand words. <laughs> uh, I might just say, <laughs> every picture tells a story. <laughs> Can we come back? After 30 years, after more than 30 years of looking through a viewfinder, adjusting the lens to capture a moment, capture a face, capture a character... Does it still excite you? Absolutely. It never stops exciting me. The great thing about photography is you never stop learning. You never stop getting excited. And I, when I get the photo that I'm proud of, it's as a thrill now as it was 30 years ago. Tony Martin, it's been great speaking with you. Thanks, Thanks very so much. much. Cheers.